For a long time, capital and labor seemed to be able to get together, at least in, in, in Western in United States society, in Canadian society. There's a period called Fordism, and it was built upon a, a muting of class struggle. And it was during that time that uh, <coughs> it, it seemed to many that you know, there'd be a liberal outcome for the capitalist system. We know that in the 1970s, this collapsed. The reasons that we could take up in questions, if you like, but the Fordist period ground to a halt in a, in a terrible accumulation crisis that was almost as bad as the current one and led to a transformation within capitalism, which we call the neoliberal period. Now, the neoliberal period uh, succeeded in restoring accumulation, but at the price of degrading labor, vastly increasing the differences between uh, rich and poor, and uh, in general doing something else that is very much on our minds today. That is to say, it greatly heightened the internal tendency of, innate tendency of capitalism to degrade the conditions of its own production, which in broad terms represents nature. And from the early 70s, which is an odd thing because in the early 70s, we began having these um, periods of, uh, we had, you know, Earth Day in, in April 22nd. Everybody, Earth Day, and everybody walks around and puts green clothes on and smells of flowers and, oh, let's recycle and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, every year, Earth Day. You know, every year some celebrities are, are hauled out to celebrate Earth Day and so forth. And every year, Marx sits in his grave or goes back to Soho and says, oh, you got it wrong, guys, you got it wrong. Uh, the degradation of nature, the destruction of the ecological foundations of the world occurs because of the capitalist system of production. Then that, it, although at a certain level we might all want to, things to turn out better, we all know that the most important thing is profitability and accumulation of capital. And to do that, the capitalists will sacrifice the world itself, as they are in fact trying to do. And here we can go into many details, which I'd be glad to entertain if we have enough time and energy to do so, and we'll come back to some of this tomorrow, which I think would be very definitely covered in, in, in an interesting way in tomorrow's sessions. But the fact, of the, matter, and the fact of the matter is that whether we're talking about climate change, or whether we're talking about species loss, or whether we're talking about the ever-widening degradation of things like soils, and, or whether we're talking about you know, the water ecology, or whether we're talking about simply the spread of pollution inhabiting our bodies, that you know, if you take the, the blood serum of any person in this room, you will find that he or she has about one to 200 foreign substances that, floating around in our bloodstreams that we were never ever evolved to cope with because in the last uh, 75 years there's been about 75,000 new chemicals thrown into the ecosystem, a miracle of our chemical industries and our plastic industries and every time you have a sandwich with plastic wrap on and you take that plastic wrap off, just think of the molecules that are sticking to that sandwich, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's true and you know it's true and it forces us to confront this crisis now as a twofold crisis, not simply the crisis of accumulation and, and screwing the worker and forcing him or her into ever worse conditions. As you know, workers' incomes have actually declined relative to the levels of 30 years ago. That's the a round of applause for the eco, uh, for the eco, for the neoliberal regime, okay? They have succeeded in lowering workers' wages and, of course, succeeded in raising workers' indebtedness and, of course, they have succeeded in financializing everything because the capitalist accumulation process won't tolerate uh, any restraints, you know? And so if it's just limping along at 2 to 3%, which is not good so far as the capitalist is concerned, they're going to go bananas and try to develop really clever and complex ways of, of, of increasing their wealth through absolutely phony means of just you know, using money to create money, which is aggravating entirely the fetishism of, of commodities and the fetishism of money and, the, and the, the overweening power now, which Marx would have pre did predict, of finance capital amongst all of the divisions of capitalism. 
So that's happening, and at the same time, the ecological crisis is not abating. Of course, there are some good things that are happening. In fact, since the United States went into economic shock in 2008, uh, carbon emissions have dropped by about 7%. Bravo, bravo. But the capitalists are not settling for that. And right now, they're fighting amongst themselves and with the American people for sucking the oil out of your Alberta oil fields. And Canada is saying, oh, if you don't do that, we're going to sell it to Asia. And you're in a lot of trouble. And so don't bet against Obama, OK, that he might he'll go along with this. You know? he, he, I, he, he'll go along with this. He's a creep. He's a capitalist tool. That's, uh, all the politicians are bought. We know this. At the same time, you also want to say that this system has produced a kind of a global economy, a global system that uh, which has always been present because capital has never been uh, uh, limited to the boundaries of one society. The Communist Manifesto is uh, entirely, uh, you know, Frank on this point has brilliant stuff about the pen barrier, the, the bourgeoisie breaking down the walls of other societies, and et cetera, et cetera, free trade. But nothing of the sort has happened. Uh, com comparable to what's happened in the last 30 years in terms of world trade, in terms of the fluidity of financial measures and this and that. And in a little letter between Marx and Engels, I think it was in the early 1860s, uh, you, perhaps you know this letter, uh, Marx writes to Engels, he says, well, you know, I just wonder what will happen because you know, even if we have a revolution in Europe, uh, capital still has the rest of the world to take over and they can export their contradictions everywhere else. What's going to happen when they run out of room to take over the rest of the world? What's going to happen when the last societies are brought under their thumb? Well, what's going to happen is what's happening now. Right. And that's the great moment of a rise of a global society and a global reaction to this dreadful system under which we live. And, and um, the Suitability of Marx resides, in, 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 first of all, in the fact that despite the fact, you know, he lived in times when the ecological crisis was only a dim cloud on the horizon. Um, so he didn't write a whole lot about it. What he wrote about it was very, very trenchant and telling. But I, I just want to read you again two last quotes from Marx and then finish and then we can have a discussion. Um, again, from the, on the Jewish question, um, he writes that... Um, Here's a quote. The view of nature attained under the dom domination of private property and money, that is to say in capitalism, in 1843, he's right, is a real contempt for and practical debasement of nature. He was sharp. He knew that 1843, before he had worked out the labor theory of value and the whole system, this is the opening salvo. He says, contempt for nature, it's the enemy of nature. It is in this sense, and here's another religious note, in a 1524 pamphlet, Thomas Munza, who was Martin Luther's great antagonist in the peasant wars and in the Protestant Reformation, Munza declared it intolerable, quote, that all creatures have been turned into property, the fishes in the water, the birds in the air, the plants on the earth, the creatures too must become free. Um, Clearly, Marx agrees with Munzer. Clearly, this is a high, tremendously radical statement worthy of any radical ecological environmentalist uh, politics. And then this is the final quote from Marx from the Capital, Volume 3. Maybe some of you have heard this. Worth always reading to show you how radical the guy was. From the standpoint of a higher economic form of society, Private ownership of the globe by single individuals will appear quite as absurd as private ownership of one man by another. Even a whole society, a nation, or even all simultaneously existing societies taken together are not the owners of the globe. They are only its possessors, its usufructuaries. And usufruct is an ancient tradition in law, means that you can take something if you're going to return it and improve it and enjoy it at the same time. It's, so he said that at best we are usufructuaries of nature. And <clears throat> like good, he says, bonet patris familias, like good parents, we must hand it down to succeeding generations in an improved condition. 
That's pretty amazing for somebody in 1860, you know, the 1860s to write that. And it shows, again, several things that we could wind up with. Uh, as he, I, I do believe that his encounter with the universalism of Christ and the, um, the notion that he gave Marx the power to think such daring thoughts as that there should be no more private property, there should be no money, there should be no state, okay? All creatures should be free. We should have a free association of producers. That uh, free, freely associated labor is the sine qua non of a transformed society. And that you have to attend to nature just as the same as you have to attend to, to, to humanity. In fact, in the great work that very few read, but everybody should, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, he talks about Marx, humanism, becoming human, and that's so he said, that's Marxist humanism. Well, it's more than Marxist humanism, because he also said, our humanism is also a naturalism, and our naturalism is also a humanism. That's stated fully in this uh, remarkable document, which was never published because he just ran off and he had too much radical stuff to do in between, but he, he developed his thinking in that. So you see, the grandeur and universality of his thought extends across the human nature boundary. Right? And it extends to the everlasting hatred of an exploitative system that destroys the potentials within ourselves to become fully realized universal creatures, which is certainly what capitalism does. And so the relevance of Marx for our crisis today, which is now uh, bursting forth in a way that is extremely hopeful and must be discussed in great detail and lived, through by all of you, because we must change the world, not just understand it, okay, is, is due to his, his passion for <sighs> profoundly radical, transformative thinking, his willingness to not settle for any kind of reformism, his notion that we must go all the way if we are to be saved and if we are to save the earth. And so it's that universal and passionate quality of Marx and the range of his thinking and the, you know, the, the courage with which he enunciated, which I think is not sufficient, but it is necessary for us to move through this current extremely challenging, daunting, but also somewhat hopeful time in human history. Thank you. <laughs>